getting up what I think is incredibly early for an academic, at least in Australia at about 7 a.m. Uh, to give us, a, give us a talk. So thank you very much, Stefan, for joining us today and looking forward to your talk. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. That's great. Um, well, I'm fortunately I'm in Brussels, so I'm an hour ahead in the UK and it's only seven in the morning here. So that's no, no big deal. Thank you for having me and thanks for the kind introduction. So what I want to talk about today is what I call the knowledge dementors. Uh, for anybody who's read Harry Potter, you know what that is. They're basically uh, soulless creatures that deprive human minds of intelligence. And the argument I want to make is that um, we live in a time where we're at risk of that actually happening to us on a large scale. And to place this into context, I want to present you with my personal very brief history of, of lies in politics. Now, I chose American presidents to illustrate this because we know a lot about what they do, including when they're not telling the truth. Um, and also because there's been so much emphasis recently uh, on Donald Trump. Now, I would argue that there has been a translation here from an earlier time when presidents lied for a particular purpose to Donald Trump, most recently, who basically just lies. Um, now, here are some statistics from the Washington Post fact checkers for his time in office. Um, he made more than 30,000 false claims, which is equivalent to about 21 per day. So by the time you take out sleep and all that, you, you're down to you know more than one per hour. Um, and it's not just the quantity, it is also that what I would like to argue is that there's been a shift, as I already hinted at, from what I would call systemic lies, which are carefully curated and have a purpose, to um, an epistemic insouciance that some people have characterized as shock and chaos disinformation. So what's the difference here? Well, I would argue that if you look at Nixon trying to get out of Watergate, Ronald Reagan got caught doing something, Bill Clinton got caught doing something, you know, I mean, they all had a sort of a reason to uh, tell, you know, furfies. Uh, but now with Donald Trump and other individuals uh, around the world, lies <clears throat> often have no apparent specific purpose. I mean, sometimes you wonder, why isn't he just telling the truth? It's kind of like, what? You know, what's the point? Um, moreover, if you then challenge those false statements and say, hey, well, hang on, you know, that's not true. You, you, you were not in the White House working. We, you were golfing in Florida. We saw you, you know. Um, then the the responses to those challenges are not kind of like uh, a claim that no 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 actually i'm right you're wrong but it's an ontological gerrymandering i think it's a wonderful term what happens is that people basically are redefining what truth is by making up constructs such as alternative facts or just saying truth isn't truth or the last two individuals are British uh, right wing personalities who, you know, they just say, oh, well, you know, facts are boring. That's just, you know, whatever one person thinks it's a fact, or somebody else thinks it's a lie, we can't tell the two apart. Now, that is, I think, a very important and qualitative shift of the type of misleading information that uh, politicians around the world are producing. I think we have to understand that. What is also then important is that this does not seem to translate into a political problem for the person. This is the uh, timeline of Donald Trump's approval rating, and it was basically relatively flat. You could argue that since he lost the election here, he went down quite a bit because of his subsequent refusal to, to concede the election. But overall, this looks pretty flat. And at no point in his presidency did less than 77% of his own party approve of him. So yeah, there's no political price to be paid 
for this epistemic insouciance and constant misleading statements. And you can make precisely the same argument in the United Kingdom, where we have a very similar uh, individual uh, in power at the moment. Now, um, the reason I'm concerned about this is because if you go back to the 1960s, the period after World War II, um, for example, Hannah Arendt, who was one of the foremost analysts, to my mind, of totalitarianism and fascism, she's known for this, very well known for this uh, uh, quote, which is that, you know, if you completely substitute facts with lies, then it's not that people start believing the lies, it's that they just give up of having any sense of bearing in the world. And, you know, this ontological gerrymandering I mentioned is, is a symptom of that uh, evolution. So I would argue, uh, and I don't have time to get into the evidence, but to my mind, there's pl plenty of evidence to this, that the shock and chaos disinformation that characterizes certain politicians and countries is destabilizing democratic institutions and ultimately could facilitate authoritarianism. Uh, I mean, don't forget, the United Kingdom parliament was illegally shut down in what some people could say is an authoritarian coup uh, not that long ago. And it had absolutely no political consequences of any type. It was just, yeah, OK. Um, so that's the, the stage on which my research is unfolding. Um, and so the three dementors I want to talk about are conspiracy theories, diversion, and micro-targeted manipulation. And I'm now going to get into um, a little bit of theory and data about these three different issues, uh, starting out with the rather unsurprising fact that a lot of shock and chaos disinformation involves conspiracy theories. Here is the former tweeter in chief uh, basically labeling climate change a hoax. Now, he's not the only one <laughs> by far. You know, I know of a country in the Southern Hemisphere that's dominated by the mining industry where this stuff happens all the time as well. Um, and it's important to kind of look at this briefly because um, conspiracy theories or the expression of conspiracies is not just random noise. Well, it is that too, but it's random noise with consequences. There's quite a bit of data now suggesting that the mere exposure to conspiracy theories uh, decreases people's intention to engage in politics or to um, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, when you're exposed to a conspiracy theory, you can show that people lose trust in government institutions that are actually unconnected to the conspiracy theory. So people lose trust in their local library. They're exposed to a conspiracy theory about you know, inflation rates or something. Um, and so we got to, you know, we got to look at this a little and, and kind of figure out what's going on because these are not value neutral utterances. Now, what I've become fascinated with recently is why it is people engage in such rhetoric because it is, it is widespread. Um, now, there, there are, of course, people who are disposed towards uh, believing conspiracy theory. Uh, we can predict it on the basis of personality variables and also the fact that they believe one. You know, many of us have a favorite Uncle Bruce who, who believes just about anything you can have a conspiracy theory about, from contrails to climate change. Um, these people certainly exist. Um, but, I would argue that sometimes um, it, it, it arises, the rhetoric arises or emanates through a different process. And that's the one I want to talk to you about now. And as a tool to create the leverage to understand this empirically, let's start with the well-known fact that free market endorsement, people's views of the free market predicts uh, rejection of climate science. And the effect is pervasive, it's replicated, it is, it is huge. Uh, here are some data from a, an analysis spanning 24 different countries. Uh, I've done it also myself in Australia in, in, 
in the US, and there's just a massive effect size that the more people endorse free markets or equivalent constructs, uh, the, the more they deny climate change. Okay, we, I'm only mentioning this because it is, um, it gives us the empirical leverage that we need to examine this process. <laughs> now, <clears throat> why might this ideological association, why might like this be related to conspiracy theorizing or conspiratorial rhetoric. Well, I would argue that for people we're talking about here, um, adherents of a, of a you know, laissez-faire extreme free market, uh, for them, the real problem isn't climate change, but <laughs> dealing with it. Because um, what that would require if climate change were happening is, is an interference in everything you hold dear if you're a libertarian, you know? I mean, it's interfering with your freedom. It's interfering with, with you know, everything you want to do. You might have to pay more taxes. There might be regulations. These are all things that are deeply emotionally challenging to people who hold those views. Now, if the evidence for climate change is, is overwhelming and if most scientists agree, as in fact they do, we know that, um, then, what do you do if you don't want to accept the fact that you can no longer fly to Bali on a holiday without feeling guilty? Well, one way to do this is to just say, oh, well, the scientists all agree because they're all in it for the money or in a conspiracy to create the world government or something like that. That's a way out. It's a get out of jail for free card if you translate your ideological challenge into an accusation of a conspiracy. And so now that we have that sort of leverage to kind of maybe triggers people's, trigger people's identity, defensive cognition, let me tell you about the study where, where I uh, tried to show that. Now, what we did there, this just came out a couple of weeks ago, um, we queried the scientific consensus. In other words, we, we asked people their perception of uh, the, the scientific consensus on these three issues, the causal relationship between HIV and AIDS, between CO2 and climate change, and then also vaccinations for various reasons, because their their vaccine anti-vax attitudes tend to be highly correlated with dispositional conspiracism. So there's a reason for putting that in. So I asked people, hey, you know, what do you think? How many out of a hundred, how many believe? this fundamental scientific fact. Um, and then I collect their responses and say, yeah, okay, fine. A second later, I tell them that actually there is a consensus. No matter what they said previously, I just tell them there is, uh, truthfully, of course. And then I ask, well, why do you think the scientists agree on this? And I provide a number of different options. Now, if you look at these sort of options that people can endorse to varying extent, you know, they see them all and they kind of say, well, here's my weighting of the factors that contribute to this. What you can see is that there is one that, you know, gives the scientists credit for arriving at the consensus because the evidence says so. And all the others are, are kind of not just words, they're actually spelled out and explained in the experiment, but they're, they're issues that are hinting at uh, conspiracy. You know, these are conventional, totally common conspiratorial rhetoric on blogs. You know, scientists are out to get funding. They're all in a group think, you know, they all go to the same conferences and then they agree. You know, <laughs> no one who's ever been to a conference would say that, but never mind. Oh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I then want to know <laughs> how do people express their perception. Uh, uh, or express the reasons for what I now tell them is a scientific consensus. Mm -hmm. And I also take a measure of political views, which for the purposes here, I score as conservatism, but of course it's, it's bipolar. I could have called it liberalism. It, you know, it's just, I had to express it somehow. And I wanna ask, you know, how do political views predict the presumed reasons for a consensus? What does your politics have to do with what you think the scientists are doing uh, with regard to the evidence? I'm going to show you two graphs here that, that are 
kind of require a bit of explanation because they're, they're showing correlations. Now in this graph, I'm showing you the correlation between conservatism with the endorsement of these various presumed reasons for the consensus. And they're listed on the left for each of the three domains. Now the gray dots are not significant. And I've already plotted it for AIDS. What this means is there's no politics in AIDS in, in at the uh, now the study was done, you know, recently. There's no politics in AIDS. Doesn't matter what your political views are. It's unrelated to your belief about why scientists have a consensus. Um, now look at climate change. Wow, all hell breaks loose. Now, all of a sudden, there are huge correlations with your political attitudes. The more conservative you are, the less, by quite the substantial correlation, you attribute the consensus to, to the evaluation of evidence, and the more you contribute it to uh, these conspiratorial reasons. But it's not your disposition to believe in conspiracy theories that's driving this, it's your political attitudes. Vaccinations in between. Now, if you go back to the literature and you look at the importance of these, the political variable on these issues, you find that the extent of what I'm picking up here um, is directly proportional to the uh, magnitude of the correlation between conservatism and attitudes overall. The more political views matter, they matter more for climate change than vaccinations, the more people are pulled apart here in their expression of a uh, conspiratorial reason for the consensus. And here, similar correlations, but not with conservatism now, now with dispositional conspiracism, which I also measured, I haven't told you that yet, but the questionnaire, the survey also included uh, a known instrument to assess people's um, propensity to engage in conspiracy theorizing. And look, climate now all of a sudden almost disappears. Uh, AIDS is substantial and vaccinations is huge. This driving apart between, you know, the real reason for the consensus and the imagined conspiratorial reasons. And again, the, the, the extent of this bifurcation is directly proportional to what we know from other research about the importance of conspiratorial dispositional conspiracism on attitudes towards these uh, scientific issues. Now, these are the same people in both graphs. And what you can now see is what triggered the conspiratorial rhetoric with climate change was not whether people were conspiracy theorists, the proverbial tinfoil hat. No, that didn't trigger it. It was their politics. Um, I think that's important to understand because, um, you know, there's so much conspiratorial rhetoric out there. You kind of sometimes wonder, do you really, do they really believe all this? And what this study suggests to me is that, well, no, not necessarily. What is happening is that if there is another reason for people to have to reject science, then engaging in a conspiratorial rhetoric is a get out of jail for free card. You know, ah, they're all, you know, leave me alone, it's a hoax. That sort of a comment. Now that has consequences elsewhere, as I've already shown. So it's not like trivial, but it is important to understand that very often this is a rhetorical tool rather than a true attitude. And um, um, just by coincidence, right before the pandemic started and everybody started getting into conspiracy theories, a colleague of mine and I published a handbook that explains how you can deal with, uh, you know, communicate with, with people who believe in conspiracy theories. And I'm about to pop a few links in the chat. One of them is to this handbook. The other one is to some other things, public facing documents I, I may mention later on. So just in case you want to read up on this stuff or talk to Uncle Bruce at the barbecue. This is, this is uh, where you can find some guidance. Okay, tick. That's one problem we got to worry about uh, in, in society, I think. If evidence-based, uh, scientific evidence and evidence-based policymaking is dismissed because of 
conspiratorial rhetoric. Now, the next question I want to ask is, how do the media handle shock and chaos disinformation? Now, the conventional wisdom is that the media uh, set the agenda in political discourse. When I say conventional, I mean that sort of 20 years of political science until recently. Uh, and, and you can show that uh, the, the media have causal effects on public discourse through various means. Uh, there, there really isn't uh, a question there, or is there? Because, again, recently, things have turned out very differently. Um, the tweeter in chief uh, was very active during his time in the uh, White House. And it struck me some time ago, this is going back a number of years now before he took office, but after he was elected, um, it struck me surprising that he would become so exercised at the time over a tiny controversy at a Broadway play. I don't know if you recall this, it might not have been reported in Australia, but basically the cast of a stage play pleaded for a diverse and united America to Vice President-elect Pence, who was in attendance. And the cast knew that, and so they said, hey, you know, <laughs> don't forget about us. Uh, and, and Donald Trump became quite exercised uh, over that. Now, uh, why? Well, I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that if you look at Google Trends, which uh, reflects the search volume by the public, for any keyword over time, uh, what you can see is that the public became very interested in, in this controversy uh, for like two days or a day or something in, in about November 2016. Um, and there was something else here, the blue line, that they weren't interested in. What was that something else? Well, it just so happened that on the same day, Donald Trump settled a $25 million lawsuit against him over this defunct Trump University, which included a $1 million penalty to the state of New York. So basically an admission of uh, fraud. Well, no one had any interest in that. And so we thought, wow, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, what's going on here? A shiny object on Twitter and the public no longer cares about what actually should have been quite a, well, in the, you know, pre all this, settling for fraud with a penalty would have been politically damaging to politicians. It's perhaps hard to believe in retrospect, but it used to be kind of, you know, not an easy thing to shrug off. So what we wanted to examine in a, in a, in a recent work is to, to see whether Donald Trump does this systematically. Does he divert attention of the media uh, from harmful coverage? And this is a theoretical model. It's not even a model. It's just a little uh, uh, flow chart that if that were the case, we should be able to establish the statistical relationship between media coverage that is harmful to Donald Trump, diversionary activity of some sort on Twitter, and if that's successful, then maybe the media might even drop that issue, right? That, that could happen. So we looked at this, we operationalized it by um, considering anything having to do with Russia and the Mueller investigation to be politically damaging to Donald Trump. Our sampling period here was the first two years of his presidency. So back then in the Jurassic age, um, two years ago, Russia Mueller was a very important issue in the US and around the world because it was about Trump colluding with the Russians during the election campaign. <clears throat> now, we also analyzed his political strengths that, that he himself thought were his strengths. We identify some of them in this flowchart here. They're fairly obvious if you know anything about American politics. And so we said, hey, you know, well, if the media talk about Russia Mueller, does Donald Trump talk about jobs? And so we looked at the two, two main media sources in the United States, the New York Times, ABC News uh, headlines, uh, and then Donald Trump's tweets and related that statistically. Now, let me show you the data for our first keyword-based analysis. 
does Donald Trump divert? Does he resort to topics that are his strengths if the media reports something that he doesn't like? Now, the numbers are tiny, so I, I display them slightly larger with the asterisks that are really relevant here, because these are regression coefficients and they're all uh, significant and positive. That means, yes, we can pick up statistically that when the New York Times talks more about Russia, Donald Trump will talk more about jobs or China or whatever on that day than would be expected on, on the basis of random fluctuation. Does this work? In other words, are the media sensitive to this? Well, to answer that question, we looked at Donald Trump's tweets from yesterday because the media are, are slow even today they take a few hours at least to respond to what the president does so there's a lag here we looked at yesterday's tweet to predict today's coverage in the new york times adc and the average and you get negative co coefficients that are also significant and uh, they're tiny and, and and borderline and i mean you know but there seems to be an effect here so it seems to be that the new york times stops well, reduces coverage of Russia Mueller when Donald Trump tweets about jobs the day before. Now, this was the analysis was was successful, but not terribly convincing. So what we well, not enough, uh, not convincing enough. So what we did was to look at everything that Donald Trump tweeted about his entire vocabulary. And we also examined neutral media coverage for comparison. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of graphs to, to present what we found in this uh, big data analysis. And to do so, I have to explain what we did. Now, we looked at all possible tweeted word pairs of Donald Trump uh, out, of, out of his whole vocabulary. So we're talking about you know, thousands, or some, some large number. For each of these word pairs in a tweet, we tried to predict whether the incidence of that word pair was a function of New York Times coverage of Mueller Russia the same day. Um, and by the way, in this analysis, there's like a hundred other variables in the regression to control for order correlations and time of year, time of year and all that sort of thing, uh, just as an aside. Now we then take that regression coefficient and in the graphs that are to follow, we plot it on the x-axis. Actually, we plot the t-value so you instantly get significance values. For the same tweeted word pair, we then do a regression model that tries to predict New York Times coverage on the next day of Russia Mueller um, as a function of, of the number of such tweets in the previous day. Previous day we plot that on the y-axis. And so if, if, you know, for each word pair, we can draw a location in space. X, Y, Z are arbitrary pairs of words in Donald Trump's vocabulary, but they now have a location in the space where if nothing is happening, there should be a blob in the middle. I mean, that's that's obvious, right? You know, on average, there's nothing. So across there, there should just be a point cloud uh, in the middle. And in fact, we would expect that to happen for neutral items that shouldn't trigger Donald Trump's concern. Now, if he then uh, attempts to divert from this inconvenient coverage, then the points should be shifted over to the right. That just means he's tweeting more of certain things, certain word pairs. And if that is successful, so it is suppressing media coverage the next day, then we should see a whole bunch of points in the bottom right quadrant. That is lots of activity by Trump and less by the media the next day. All right, so let's have a look. What do we find in the analysis? Well, we start out with something neutral, gardening. Okay, the New York Times reports gardening occasionally. Donald Trump does very little in response. If anything, he tweets less of everything. It puts him more gardening, puts him to sleep. I don't know, but there, there is this slight hint that uh, he, he reduces his activity 
that may be because gardening is only reported on the weekends or whatever. I'm really concerned about that. But we get a blob largely in the middle. And by the way, uh, these contours here are another statistical uh, uh, synthetic null distribution based on the same data, but randomized that tells us what we would expect by chance uh, using precisely the same randomized observations. So we did this for a whole bunch of terms, the economy, football, gardening, skiing, you know, these are all things where all the points are largely in the middle, nothing terribly uh, uh, exciting happens. And the word clouds beneath the, the point clouds tell you what uh, the coverage was actually about. In other words, they, they tell us uh, or confirm to us that when we're picking up these keywords in the New York Times, it's not anything weird. It is actually <laughs> articles about gardening or skiing. You can just look from look at that from the uh, uh, word clouds. Finally, what about Russia and Mueller? Okay, that's what this is all building up to. Well, here it is. This is the New York Times reporting on Russia and Mueller. Uh, it traced a lot of Twitter activity by the president and it is followed by a suppression of media coverage the next day. We get a number, disproportionately large number of points in the bottom right quadrant. Each point now, remember, is just a pair of words in Donald Trump's tweets. I'll tell you in a moment what words those are. The same for ABC, independently, considered independently. Again, this more Russia Mueller means more tweets by Donald Trump, and the next day ABC News is less likely to talk about Russia Mueller. And this is after we put, a, put in a hundred, literally a hundred or more control variables to, to uh, account for autocorrelations and all that sort of thing. So in a nutshell, what happens is this. When the New York Times talks about Russia Mueller, and those are the words being used in that coverage, then Donald Trump tweets more about those issues shown on the right, which are the, the word pairs in the, in the bottom right quadrant of my graphs. And then the next day, American media reduces its coverage of that uh, inconvenient topic, inconvenient to Donald Trump. I'm exaggerating the size of the effects here in this visual demonstration, but that is effectively what is happening. So the media uh, are responsive and were guided by Donald Trump's tweets. We don't know if that's conscious or intentional or whatever. It doesn't really matter. We also cannot be absolutely sure it's causal because, you know, this is a correlational study. But we put in as many controls and other things to look at as possible to, to at least make it plausible that there is a uh, causal relationship. So that gets me on to the last issue, which is um, that there are a few things we should talk about that should worry you. Because everything I said so far is, is not, well, maybe you're worried, uh, but if you are, then there's more that, that I personally think is, is far more concerning. And that's Facebook. Now, I know everybody bashes book. Um, okay, I, I, I do to, to some extent, uh, but I do so on the basis of what I know is, is going on with Facebook. Now, the first thing, this is now almost part of public knowledge, perhaps, I don't know, but knowing your likes on Facebook allows me or anyone else to identify your personality with greater accuracy than your own spouse okay and here are the data showing that the the number of likes that you have access to by the time you get to 300 the machine learning algorithm that that is being trained to predict your personality uh, is is higher up here in performance than your spouse and 10 likes is sufficient for the algorithm to do better than your work colleagues. So, okay, we can predict personality um, using Facebook likes. Does it matter? Well, 
Yes, I think it does. Here's one study that uh, tried to look at this. They looked at more than 3 million participants, so power was not an issue. Um, and they presented these participants ads that were designed to appeal to extroverts or introverts. And this was independently ascertained. And they selected the audience based on whether they're uh, extrovert or introvert. Now, you can do that in Facebook even now very easily. All you got to know what it is. All you got to know is what it is that people who are extrovert or introvert like on Facebook. Then you then launch an ad that says, I want to target people who like whatever, motorcycles and uh, ski jumping and parachuting, whatever. You know, it just so happens that these are then very likely to be extroverts. So I don't know exactly if those are the right likes, but it's well known. You can go and place an ad, get somebody who's introverted or extroverted. Now, <laughs> back to the study by Matt said, well, uh, does this work? <laughs> uh, yes, in short. And just in case you're interested, on the left here, you may now guess that it appeals to extroverts. The one on the right it appeals to introverts. If you match the ads to the um, personality of the audience, then you sell more. It's as simple as that. The measure here is, is an actual conversion rate. That means do people click on the ad on Facebook? And you can also plot the, the amount of sales for this, uh, and you get the same result. If you match an introverted ad to an introverted audience, introvert is green, uh, then you sell more than if the introverts get the extroverted ad. And the reverse is true. If the extroverted ad is seen by an extroverted audience, you sell more than if that audience gets an introverted ad. So it works. And by the way, Facebook owns a patent to infer personality for targeted advertising. So the fact that, you know, I mean, this is, I can show you a copy later. This is just, they, they, they do this and, and it's public. You know, you, you can go to the, uh, patent office in, in the US and look it up. Um, so, and you know, they wouldn't have that if they weren't at least interested in using it. And okay, with lipstick or whatever, maybe you, 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 you wouldn't care. And I agree that really, I'm not terribly concerned about it. That doesn't keep me up at night. What is more concerning <clears throat> is when these micro-targeted messages are used for political purposes. If people are customizing manipulative political messages to, um, you know, keep a person from going to vote, for example, or trying to get them to vote for some other uh, politician or whatever. The problem with micro-targeting is, one of them, is that only the recipient and the sender knows the content of the message. The political opponent doesn't and can't, um, or at least couldn't in the past. And that, of course, means that there is no rebuttal possible, and that's undermining this whole idea that uh, you know democracy should be about public political speech, where the voters kind of decide who makes most sense. Well, you can't do that if you only get manipulated based on your personality by a politician who can say anything they want because they can assume it'll stay confidential in, in, in this bubble. So I think there's some serious problems uh, relating to this. And if you're interested in this, uh, that link is also already in the chat. Um, I was the lead author amongst you know, a team of, of other people of a report for the European Commission that looked at this in depth, uh, this relationship between technology and democracy. And the not, in, in a nutshell, the bottom line is you gotta, you gotta worry about this. It's, it's a non-trivial uh, problem, no matter what uh, the platforms may have done in response or maybe saying now, there are some deep conceptual issues 
with manipulative micro-targeting of political messages. So what do we do other than, you know, the reason I'm in Brussels, by the way, right now is because I work with the European Commission on uh, issues related to this in platform governance. So, uh, but until that has happened and there has been some, some agreement, the internet has to look a little different, what can we do? Well, the last, last study I want to talk about in a few more minutes is um, the question is whether we might be able to reverse engineer micro-targeting and whether we might boost users' knowledge about themselves so they could become resistant to this. And as a first step in this, we ran a number of experiments that are actually very simple, where we administered a personality scare, we a scale, we used introversion, extroversion because it's so reliable and so much is known about it. And we provided feedback to people about their score. And then, all they had to do was to classify the ads from the previous study by MAPS et al. into whether or not they were targeted at the person in question. And in a control condition, we, we gave them an unrelated personality or well, not a person, an attitude scale about technology that we thought was completely unrelated. But ultimately, we there also measured extroversion, introversion, because we had to classify people to, to analyze the data. So, I'll walk you through the procedure very quickly. You take this personality inventory, and before you take it, um, you receive an explanation of what this means. Of course, it's much more involved than this here. This is just a thumbnail of our manipulation, but you know, you get a sense. Uh, okay, that's extroverts, that's introverts. You then get personalized feedback based on your score instantly. An extrovert might receive this, you know, ah, you're here. Um, there's only 26 people your age that are more extroverted. Everybody else is less extroverted. So you're pretty extroverted. And alternatively, another, this is an extreme introvert, they might get this feedback telling them, no, that's, that's who you are. Correctly, truthfully. No deception here at all. Then, uh, the task is to classify ads. Is this ad targeted at you, yes or no? Uh, well, what do you think? Imagining you're an ex extrovert, would you say yes or no? Imagining you're an introvert, would you say yes or no? Well, here are the data. If you look at the accuracy of classification, defined as people saying, yes, I'm targeted, when in fact that ad matched their personality. Uh, giving people personality feedback boosted their ability to classify by 30 percentage points compared to the control condition. It's a massive effect. In fact, the modal score was 100% correct after they were given feedback on their personality. Without that feedback, people were still above chance, but not by that much. You know, this is significantly above chance, but then we have hundreds of participants. Um, you know, but it wasn't a big effect. So telling people about their personality uh, enables them to detect when they're being targeted on the basis of that personality. And we ran two more experiments where we kind of withheld more and more information. Um, the green dots refer to an experiment where all we told people was something about extroversion, introversion. Just a little bit of this is what it is. Um, that by itself achieved nothing. That green dot in the control condition is the same statistically as after the information is provided. People are again above chance, uh, but telling them about extroversion is insufficient to change anything. If you give people the questionnaire, the instrument, the personality instrument, and provide no feedback, that does boost their performance. So you don't have to tell them exactly who they are, but they have to engage with the questionnaire and answer the questions. But the boost isn't nearly as strong as what you get if you also give the personalized feedback. So we now have some boundary conditions already on this phenomenon. And we know that people have to at least engage be engaged in their own assessment in order to 
resist micro-targeting. Uh, well, when I say resisting targeting, at least they can detect it. And that's a first step towards uh, resisting because, you know, if you don't even know it's happening, then how are you going to resist manipulation? But if you know it's happening, then at least you can say, well, do I really want to buy a lipstick that some guy is trying to sell me based on my personality? You know, that, that, then at least you can, you can arguably take the first step uh, towards resistance and, and watch this space. We're currently, of course, working on that, uh, that very issue. And with that, I'll thank you because that's those are my three knowledge dementors that we have to resist. And I look forward to taking questions if there's time. Thank you. Um, so th thanks, Stephen. Oh, Stephen, for that talk. What we're going to do is we're going to do a weird. It's it's a hybrid colloquium model that we've got going on. There's going to be questions from the Q and A box um in zoom and what i'm going to do as well is from the people who are here i've got a microphone um and so if you put your hand up if you want to ask Stephen a question i'll come and give you the microphone so then you can chat with them directly okay so who would like to ask a question um i actually have one to start out with though um that the information that you put up earlier about vaccines and vaccinations and political beliefs is a lot of people here in australia who would endorse an anti-vax um, response, I would probably consider to be left of centre for politically, but you had a strong correlation with uh, conservatism in your data. Um, yes. Is that a recent thing because of Donald Trump I mean, driving the anti-vax response in Republicans? No, no, it's not recent. Uh, I, I, I first showed that in 2013 in a paper in 2013 with a study probably conducted in 2012, so it was a long time ago. If you look at the literature, you can go back even further and find occasional hints of this effect. Overall, across all the data I've seen in the United States, uh, but also in, in, in other countries, Matt Hornsey has done it in 24 countries. Overall, anti-vaxxers are on the political right. Hmm. I know, the anecdotes, and everybody says, no, 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 that's, that they're, you know, that's the equivalent of climate denial for the right is vaccine denial for the left. Well, it's just not true. It's just not true. Uh, and I mean, I run representative surveys with a thousand people, thousand Americans representative samples over and over and over again. I mean, there's no question. In fact, if you look at voting data in Europe, <clears throat> the larger the share of populist parties in, in voting, uh, the greater the vaccine hesitancy. The correlation is amazing. It's it's like a point cloud, like like it fills the diagonal. There's hardly any scatter. Um, and if you now look at U.S. states and you look at vaccination uptake for the COVID-19 vaccines as a function of Trump voting versus Biden, you find that the states that voted for Trump, the more they voted for Trump, the less they're vaccinated. Uh, the less there's vaccine uptake. And the more they voted for Biden, the greater the uptake. And the difference is huge. It is something like 20 plus percent uh, of the population. It's a massive effect. So the data, the actual data, wherever you look, are always, from all I've seen, identifying anti-vax with the political right, not the left. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't some extreme left-wingers out there who, who are anti-vax, of course not. I mean, there, there, there is in fact also evidence that the more extreme you are in your politics, the more likely you are to engage in conspiracy theories, such as anti-vax. Um, but the, the fact that there are a tiny number of extremists on the left doesn't negate the fact that overall, there's a massive correlation uh, where anti-vax is located on the political right. And yeah, it's surprising. It surprised me too. I've been chasing left-wing science denial for nearly 10 years, and I have yet to find it in, in, in actual data, not anecdotes. Um, I'm just going to ask a follow-up question before I get over to the next person. Um, th what was the correlation between conspiratorial thinking and conservatism in your data? Um, oh, is, is political yeah. conservatism like, linked to poor... Uh, uh, what, what, because critical thinking and things like that. Um, very interesting question. In this particular sample, I can't remember offhand. I'd have to look it up. Um, but I can tell you overall what's going on. 
it is usually uh, it's labile, I think is, is the right answer because in, it, it pops up in some samples and not in others. Um, overall, the biggest study I've seen on that was done by Sander van der Linden at Cambridge recently. I think it came out last year. And he tested this, this hypothesis that it's the political extremes who resort to conspiracy theorizing. And basically what he found is, yes, that's true. However, there are far more people on the extreme right than the extreme left. Therefore, um, you, you will always or nearly always find an association between right wing thought. I mean, and, and you know, there is a continuum there. There are conservatives and then there are extreme conservatives. And then you end up with with, you know, the hard right and, and uh, white supremacists and all that. It's one continuum. If you go way out on that, then you invariably find more conspiracy theorizing there and because there's more of them. Uh, the overall correlation is, is then involving conservatism as a predictor for conspiratorial thought. That's not to say you can't be a left-wing extremist. In fact, here in the United Kingdom, it's, it's uh, remarkable how many people who ostensibly are uh, on the left. Uh, the sun just came up behind the building and I'm now blinded. Um, um, but yes, there, there's, an extreme, there's a number of people on the extreme left in the United Kingdom, um, that's uh, very susceptible to conspiracy theories. Um, Sorry, I got distracted by the sun. Stefan, I guess I'm interested in the micro targeting. I mean, in some ways, there could be benefits to some of those things if you're if you're targeting people who have health conditions that you want to recruit them to a research yes. study or make them aware of a service that's available. Uh, obviously, it's pernicious in the examples that that you're giving. Um, do you, uh, in terms of sort of addressing that issue, do is it? Would you like to see changes to legislation about this, or what? You know, is that is yeah. that in an ideal world what would happen for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me let me let me just go back to the, the conceptual issue you raised. You know, does it matter? Does micro targeting matter? And I think. Uh, that's that's actually a very nuanced question, and I agree with you. There are certain circumstances, like targeting medical messages, uh, as you already said, where micro targeting is a good thing. You know, if you know somebody is suicidal, let's say for for whatever reason, why shouldn't you be sending him messages to to assist them? You know, a helpline or something. Absolutely, I can see that. Where the problem lies, to my mind, is in the political sphere if it makes rebuttal impossible, because then you no longer have democratic debate, then all you have is manipulation, because you, you just ruthlessly lie to people and do anything you want with them to manipulate them into a desired behavior, which frankly is what happened in 2016 uh, during Brexit and, and the Trump election, the first Trump election. Now. That is problematic, no matter what. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's a whole slew of reasons why it is problematic, for example, also because it opens up the possibility for the politicians to say whatever they like to keep a certain uh, uh, part of the people happy. And they, they're never held accountable because no one else knows what they promised this one group, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of problems you can identify in terms of what to do about it, regulation, <laughs> et cetera. Well, uh, first of all, let's be clear, the internet you're experiencing today is highly regulated, except it's regulated by corporations who are not accountable to any, anyone but their shareholders at most. So uh, the problem of, of saying let's regulate the internet is actually misleading to begin with because it's already regulated. The only question is whether you want to have Facebook regulated or a publicly accountable government. Um, now, as far as Facebook's regulations are concerned, we know <clears throat> um, that's never been denied by Facebook, that Facebook was aware of the polarizing effect its algorithms had on the American public, uh, and that the, the road to extremism in America was through Facebook. And they knew this. They knew that their algorithms were responsible. 
they also knew what it would have taken to change that, but they didn't because they were worried about their profits. Now that was reported by the Wall Street Journal and, and it was never denied. And uh, uh, so we know that they know how to govern their algorithms. We also know that they know what's misinformation and what isn't because when COVID came along, all of a sudden they were very quickly able to deal with misinformation after telling us for years that they have no idea what's true and false. Wow, COVID was the truth serum, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden they can tell. So there, there are things we can do. And at the very least, what we can do is we can avoid the algorithms driving people into misinformation and polarization. And that's not censorship. That is just, you know, uh, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. We, we, we're not under any obligation to make it easy for extremists to, uh, you know, attract people. Just I'm moving the microphone up to another person. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, it's, yeah, it was a really good talk. Um, I, I want to ask, um, when you measure the conservatism and like the liberalism and conservatism, do you measure it in like the, like the skill? Because I believe that some people will believe that um, conservative, like conservative, they are like different kind of conservative or like the traditional conservative or liberal. No. Libertarianism, although I, I'm, some people will argue that libertarianism is like the other, on the other skill. Anyway, my, my question is, yeah. yeah, but my question is that since um, conservatism is um, highly, is highly correlated to the conspiracy theory of the climate change, oh. is it just like, like all conservatives or all conservatives or conservatives like have endorsed like some particular uh, ideology. I believe that because um, people with the endorsed in the free market would, uh, would reject climate change more than the traditional um, conservative that just um, like the religious conservative. So yeah, is it all conservative or just? Yeah, I, I, I understand the question. I think it's a very good question. Um, first of all, yes, I agree with you. You know, they're, they're just, they're, you have to differentiate between libertarianism and social conservatism very often. And um, when you measure both, you find the two constructs to be quite highly correlated in the United States. Um, but, but they're not identical. And you can, in fact, tease them apart sometimes. However, having said that, for the purposes of uh, climate change in particular, the effect is so strong that it just doesn't matter how you measure it. You can, measure, you can ask people whether they're Republican or Democrat, single, single question. You can give them a libertarianism scale. You can give them a conservatism slash liberalism scale. You can look at social dominance orientation. You can look at their nationalism. You can look at you know, you, you, anything that, that captures that broad cluster of, of attitudes will predict their attitudes towards climate change. So it isn't just libertarianism that is opposed to climate change. It's also conservatism measured in a, in a social manner. If you, uh, you take out the economy, you still get that relationship. So for climate change, it absolutely uh, uh, doesn't matter. Now, when you refer to my data, just remember that what I showed there was not that conservatism is related to conspiratorial thinking, only that it triggers conspiratorial thinking or endorsement of conspiracies in the context of climate change. Because for AIDS, for example, politics had no effect on, on how people explain the consensus. And that was sort of my point, that, that the conspiratorial rhetoric pops up as needed, triggered by politics, when it is needed to get people out of jail for free. Uh, we have a question from the Zoom audience. Uh, Sorsha uh, asked, do you have any idea why people appear to entertain conspiracies about climate change and vaccination? but seem not to attend to real, perhaps less interesting conspiracy theories. <laughs> that's, it, it's, that's, yeah, that's, that's a very uh, good question. Um, well, I mean, first of all, yes, of course, there are real conspiracies, no question. 
If you look at how real conspiracies are uncovered, however, you find that um, it is uncovered by completely mainstream conventional people who engage in conventional cognition. You know, journalists, whistleblowers, engineers, the Volkswagen diesel scandal was uncovered by engineers who found something funny in test results in, in the US. And I mean, that was a classic conspiracy, right? The Volkswagen diesel scandal. I mean, you can't get more classic than that. Um, whereas, whereas conspiracy theories that we believe are not true because they're, they're not supported by evidence, but tend to be uncovered by, by quite different people. I mean, you know, and it turns out their cognition is different. Uh, that's the most, to me, the most important thing that, <clears throat> you know, how do you tell whether somebody might be onto something or not? Well, work out how they think and what they say. And what you then find is that most conspiracy theorists are, you know, incoherent, for example. I mean, or, or they interpret the absence of evidence as being evidence for something, which is, you know, <laughs> That's not rational thinking by by our by Bayesian standards. Um, so that's a long way of, of not almost not answering your question. Well, I, I think the people who some of the people who are really into this kind of stuff are just attracted by by this sort of puzzling, you know, it's a puzzle. <laughs> And, and and anything goes. You can, if you believe 9/11 was an inside job, you can live in that community for 20 years and and have a wonderful time turning over, you know, newspaper headlines from 18 years ago, or somebody was in the supermarket checkout by, uh, lane with Al Gore. And, you know, that has to be relevant. You you can just do this stuff forever, and it's very entertaining. It so just has bad. Just people saying that um, the flat Earth society is spreading all over the globe. Um, the yes. <laughs> Well, and, and they, they are, and you know, one of the reasons they do is because they form a community online, which is something that was never possible until we had social media. If you were the village idiot in Gloucestershire in the 19th century who thought the earth was flat, no one would listen to you and you would never find anybody else who believed it. So you never became entrenched in that opinion and you were certainly pretty silent about it. Today you go on Facebook, you find a thousand others and you say, yeah, everybody thinks like me. And there you go. That is one of the one of the many problems with social media, that sort of false consensus effect. Um, we have another question. It's a, do propaganda and fake news work based on the same processes? Oh, uh, well, I think it depends on what you mean by process. If you're talking about the cognitive process of the recipient, yes, I would think that because the recipient doesn't know what they're exposed to. I think people process information uh, uh, the same, <laughs> you know, you don't know whether what you're listening to is misinformation or true information if it is done sufficiently cleverly. You don't know that. Um, now, there, there, there are variables that relate to personality variables and things, personal variables that relate to your gullibility of, of uh, you know, I mean, how much do you believe nonsense that is being fed at you you know like like when i see a headline that says the pope endorsed donald trump then my th i just figured yeah well no <laughs> <laughs> you know that's got to be fake news and then you check it out and sure enough it was a it was completely fake and other people might say oh i i, I believe that so there are differences in in gullibility but other than that uh, information processing is governed by by its own laws, which which we understand pretty well. By the way, one of the um, links I popped into the chat is to the debunking handbook uh, that was published last year, which which goes through the whole psychology of why people believe misinformation, why they find it difficult to to update their memories. You can have a look there. That tells you more. We've got a, a related question, and we'll make this the last one from Zoom. Is um, given the results you presented on the impact of people being told about the targeting and your work on inoculation against misinformation, what role do you see for the formal education system in tackling these problems of misinformation and manipulation? Yeah, great question. I mean, doesn't Finland all, do something like this? Uh, Finland actually has this built into their uh, primary school. Well, I was just going to say, Finland, you beat yeah. me to it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in Finland. 
it's part of the curriculum in high school, uh, uh, information literacy, and especially discernment of misinformation. And um, that, yeah, I'm, I actually haven't seen any quantitative assessment of this. Uh, uh, one of my, a friend of mine was involved in setting that up with the Finnish government. And, and so I, you know, I know it's done really well. I, I, I think it's terrific. I haven't seen any quantitative follow-up. There's other work uh, by Sam Weinberg, for example, at Stanford, uh, which is wonderful. And he teaches high school students in like an hour or something to become really savvy consumers of information by practicing something called lateral reading, which means that instead of looking at a website to try and figure out whether it's true, you go away from that website and you look elsewhere to get information about that site. And if you do that, you go laterally and you look at the New York Times, Snopes, you know, fact checkers, uh, credible sources and see what they have to say about a website, if it even shows up, uh, uh, then you know instantly if something is dodgy. Um, so yes, it plays a big role. Now, that endorsement comes with a big qualifier. And the big qualifier here is that we got to be super careful that whatever we do in this, that we are not um, platform washing, uh, for lack of a better term, um, that we're not doing something the platforms can say, see, that's the solution to the problem. Oh, we will fund education with $10 million and then we're off the hook. Okay, uh, that's, that's, you, you can't let that happen. So yeah, sure, yes to education, but actually the real problem is platform governance. I mean, it's as simple as that. And none of this will be solved unless the platforms are governed differently. And, uh, and that's happening. I'm quite optimistic about that. Uh, given another couple of, certainly in, 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 in the European Union. And, and that tends to signal things for the rest of the world. Um, so, uh, but that is the real problem and we mustn't lose sight of that in my opinion. One more question. Um, given the situation we are in with COVID at the moment, and given the anti-vaxxers, <laughs> would you have any suggestions of what should we do right now and how can we increase the vaccinations around the world? Okay. Well, funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> My colleagues and I just published this uh, handbook a couple of months ago about um, specifically COVID-19 vaccinations and hesitancy, and I, I popped the link in the chat as well. Um, well, basically, to be honest, uh, at the moment, uh, hesitancy is not a problem in most uh, Western countries, at least, that I'm familiar with. The problem is availability of vaccines. Now, that is also changing rapidly because they are becoming much, I mean, you know, in the European Union, it's, it's millions of doses per day now that come online. I mean, multiple millions of doses. Um, so will we ever get to the point where vaccine hesitancy is, is, is going to prevent us from solving the pandemic? I'm not sure at the moment, I'm not uh, terribly worried about that. Should it get to that point, then yes, there, there is a lot of information in that handbook that says, identify certain things we can do. For example, um, well, the first thing we gotta do is to talk to healthcare workers because they're the most trusted source of information for patients. So we gotta make sure the healthcare workers have sufficient information to deal with. We have to make it easy to get a vaccine. Pragmatic factors are far more, often far more important than attitudes. You know, just getting it easily is, is, is half the battle. You know, if, if a truck pulls up outside your house and there's a friendly guy offering you a vaccine, that's much more important than a, than a, a propaganda campaign or education campaign. Uh, and, and the list goes on. I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of stuff uh, we can do. But honestly, I, I do not really see it as a problem at the moment, not on a large scale. Um, 
even in the United States, I think Republican states will ultimately have greater uptake to now. Um, and in part, the, the, you know, Israel has come out of the pandemic because they've, they've had a successful vaccination campaign. So, you know, if people want to get out of the pandemic and they know how it's doable, then you know, a lot of them will, will, will do it. But there's more to it than that, but it's a brief answer. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we're going to uh, wrap it up here now because we think we've grilled you enough. <laughs> that was a fantastic talk. Uh, would everyone like to thank Stefan for his presentation? Um, I, know that, I know that you're in Brussels and it's about 8 a.m. there in the morning. Here it's about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. It's a beautiful autumnal evening. They're doing back burning in Sydney. There's a slight haze in the air. And we're going to go over to the bar and have a quiet, quiet drink in your honour. Uh, hopefully, when oh you come God. to Sydney next time, we'll be able to actually toast you personally. <laughs> yes, I can't wait. I mean, go to a bar. You don't know what that means. I, mean, <laughs> like, I didn't, it was just, it wasn't my intention to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I haven't been to a bar in I don't know how long, but uh, uh, yeah, next time I'm in Sydney, we, we got to catch up. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. And for those of you on Zoom who are on campus listening to this, come and meet us at the home courtyard bar and we'll all get together and, um, and have a nice little Friday afternoon uh, get together. Thank you again, Stefan. Ciao. Well, Sophie, that went really well. <laughs>